Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Tony Lang. I'm the director of the Movement Disorders Program here at the Toronto Western Hospital, University Health Network, University of Toronto. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to uh, another one of these sessions. We run these roughly twice a year and uh, they're usually very well received. We try to introduce the the audience to what's going on in our program. So this is more an information session for you. And so it's an open forum. We really hope that you uh, get something from it, but also that you uh, have a dialogue with us so that uh, you ask any questions that you want. And today is a special day because we're going to introduce one of our new faculty and he's going to tell you about a very important and exciting program that, uh, that we have. Uh, as I've told this group in past years, uh, we have uh, a large faculty. We're now, I think, officially um, 12, 11 uh, faculty members, neurologists that do movement disorders and other things, and each of the faculty members uh, have presented at one time or another to these, uh, to these sessions. Um, so again, thanks for coming. Um, uh, we also have to thank uh, Fraser Barrel, uh, who's unfortunately not been able to attend for his support to allow us to have it in this nice meeting area, the BMO Center. Uh, although it's attached to our hospital, we still pay for it, believe it or not. So uh, it's not like having it in a cruddy old auditorium in the hospital. So it's a, it's a much nicer venue and we're very grateful for the support that we get for it. So my... Um, First, a very simple and short job, so you'll be very pleased to hear you're not going to listen to me very much at all. Um, but my job is to tell you what's sort of new in the program and introduce you to two of our new faculty, and then one of them is going to spend the majority of the time speaking to you. So what's new? Here we are at the Toronto Western Hospital. This is the Kremble Discovery Tower that we're in, and it's a, uh, the Movement Disorders Program is part of the Kremble Neurosciences Institute or the Kremble Brain Institute. The Kremble family is really quite a remarkable family. They've been amazingly supportive of neurosciences in Toronto and in Ontario, and uh, we really couldn't do what we do without uh, their strong support and their involvement. They're engaged in what we do as well, and so it's really important to emphasize that. Um, so as I say, these speaker series have been going on now, I think, for a couple of years, and uh, we try to run it every second uh, or twice a, a year. This is the faculty that I was mentioning, and I put their names and their fields um, by the by the individuals. It's an older picture, so we don't have the two new faculty that I'm going to introduce you to. And uh, we do soup to nuts in our field. And one of the things that I'm most proud of in our program is that we cover a breadth that really isn't covered in many of the uh, other um, subspecialty areas of movement disorders around the world. Uh, there aren't very many programs, and we are proudly known as the Toronto program when you go to Harvard or when you go to Europe, uh, recognizing that each of these individuals have an international reputation of their own. All of them do things at a very, very high level, at editorial levels, at international advisory levels, and so I think we can be incredibly proud of the people that are uh, doing what they do here and caring for patients and doing their research. I'm not going to talk about each of them individually. You've, uh, those of you that have been to these sessions before have heard from some of them and over the course of the next couple of years we hope to get every one of them speaking to you. I will mention a couple of things. Dr. Susan Fox, our Associate Director, is now the new uh, Director of the Division of Neurology at the University of Health Network, so she's taken on a very important administrative role and a nurturing development role in terms of building neurology uh, here in our hospital. And we are the largest clinical neuroscience program in the city and one of the largest in the country, and she's leading a very big uh, division of neurology. The other person I'll mention is Alfonso Fazzano, who has just been awarded a chair in neuromodulation thanks to a, uh, an important philanthropic uh, um, donation that uh, I'll mention again in a, in a second. So Alfonso is a, a deep brain stimulation gate expert, but also very interested in all aspects of neuromodulation, and so he'll be supported to develop uh, a research program in that, that area. So other new uh, developments, well, the first new faculty member I'll mention is Sarah Lidstone. And Sarah, you will hear from at one of these future uh, meetings. 
Um, she finished a PhD in neurosciences at University of British Columbia, working in Parkinson's disease and the placebo effect, and uh, really established an important scientific reputation there. She did that before she did neurology, came to Toronto and did neurology, and then did movement disorders in my program here and really uh, established herself and it was quite clear that we had to recruit her. She has an interest in multidisciplinary care, so bringing multiple different areas to the care of movement disorders and particularly, but not exclusively, Parkinson's disease but also other Parkinsonian syndromes. And uh, she is developing a program at one of our sister hospitals, the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute over on University Avenue. And we're hiring uh, physiotherapy, uh, social work, uh, um, um, uh, speech and language, uh, et, et cetera, to assist in that program. So that is now actively taking off. And there's another area that she's interested in, and that is something called functional movement disorders that I'll let her tell you about at one of the next uh, meetings. But these are patients who suffer from neurological disability, but not because of a degenerative disease. They, they are disturbances of function of the brain, not structure and cellular uh, damage. So this is Sarah. And uh, as I say, she will be uh, lecturing to you or speaking to you at one of the next uh, sessions. The next big development is the, is the code blue on 9 East. <laughs> code I'm not going to fight them. Whenever we run sessions here, we always have to remind you, you're in a hospital. And so we have uh, these very important patient care announcements that we respect. Okay, so the next really important development that really uh, uh, is the basis of um, the time we're going to spend uh, from here on in this session is the recruitment of a uh, real leader in the field of neurodegenerative diseases and uh, neuropathology. I was uh, very, very lucky to have come across uh, Dr. Gabor Kovacs and uh, we, uh, my first connection with him was to ask him whether I might be able to recruit him to Toronto and he, he said, no, 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 I'm kind of happy where I am. He was in Vienna and um, things were going w pretty well for him but uh, I, I got my hook into him and I gradually reeled him in. I let him out for a little bit but I kept reeling him in and, and uh, uh, he's become uh, a, a friend and uh, a, a really close colleague and I think probably one of the most uh, important things that's happened to our program here in a long time. Um, this recruitment was made possible through two very important donations. One, uh, through the, um, the Edmund J. Saffer Foundation that has been very supportive of our entire program so you know if you've seen the signs, we run the Edmund J. Saffer program in Parkinson's, and they've been very supportive of what we do. But then a really instrumental uh, donation from the Rossi family to develop a program of both clinical and research for the assessment and care and understanding of patients with a neurodegenerative disease called progressive supranuclear palsy. This is a, a bad disease that it looks like Parkinson's disease but uh, behaves differently. And uh, this is the disease that um, Dudley Moore suffered from. You remember Dudley Moore, the uh, British comedian, uh, and unfortunately took his life as uh, this disease tends to do. And um, so with the donation from the Rossi Foundation, and we have a representative here, and Terry, welcome and thank you for coming. Um, with their donation and the combination of that and uh, the, uh, the Saffer donation, we were fortunate enough to bring uh, Dr. Kovacs to Toronto. We've also, and he'll tell you this, um, uh, been able to bring together a very large um, um, number of brains that had been part of something called the Canadian Brain Tissue Bank. And uh, with Gabor's uh, recruitment, we are able to uh, really start to use this wonderful resource. And uh, we will also, and we're just on the verge of uh, doing this, uh, we'll be building a, a brain bank program. And uh, Dr. Kovacs is going to tell you why it's so important for people with Parkinson's and other diseases, all brain diseases, to think about donating their brain to research. Um, this is a critical uh, source of information and something that I think will be uh, very important to advancing our understanding of these diseases. We don't want to stagnate. We don't want to continue to have to deal with the, 
the problems that we deal with in every day and you deal with every day with uh, the uh, loved ones that you have or the diseases that you have and one of the important ways of changing the course of the, these diseases is for experts like Dr. Kovacs to study these brains uh, after, after death and uh, I think that's uh, one of the more important things that we're going to be developing is advancing a larger brain donation program. So with those introductory remarks, Dr. Kovacs is going to tell you why that's important and how he proposes uh, to do that. So welcome, Gabor. Uh, it's a real um, pleasure to introduce you to this audience. So Dr. Gabor Kovacs. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lang, for this uh, very kind introduction. And I would like to ask the audience that who can say no to Dr. Lang regarding my recruitment. I would like to thank also the Hospital Foundation because it's, I know that it's not easy to organize such meetings. So before I start my presentation, I want to tell you my personal story. So I, I finished the university in Hungary in 94. And I started as a neurologist. I worked at the kind of a movement disorder part of the clinic. And soon I realized that I, I, I want to know more about the diseases. And I, I saw that I cannot treat everybody like I wish to do. So after work, I started to go to the neuropathology lab and stay there until the late hours and look at the microscope. So until now, I look more than, examine more than 4,000 brains in my career. So I. I saw a lot of uh, things, and, and I, I know it's not easy to talk about this, and I'm also like you, also I have the personal feelings about uh, talking about uh, autopsies and death, so I have also the same feelings if it would be my family. But let me still tell you the, the advantages of such uh, an approach. And before I start the presentation, I would like to ask you that, for example, for Parkinson's disease, we have a therapy which is giving dopamine to the patients and then help to treat the symptoms. But maybe you have asked already for yourself that why do we use this? And the reason why we use this is that in the 1950s, so the end of the 1950s, people or colleagues examined uh, human brains and they found that in Parkinson's disease, the dopamine is in a low level in the human brain. So this initiated the first steps. Why now, and still now, we have this therapy, and still now we don't have other dramatic novelty in the therapies. So actually, there's a lot of research going on in the world, and these are made in laboratories. And either these research they focus that they work in like petri dishes, like small tubes, and they look at cells. These are very in, in, uh, important that we understand how cells behave in disease. And other group of researchers, they work with experimental animal models. This is also very important because at least they can examine the behavior of the mice, see how therapies work, but actually, at one point, we have to recognize that we are humans and what we have in all these models, we have to translate it to the human brain. And as you see, this is a human brain section, which is pretty different than the mice or even the monkey brain. And we have a pretty large brain, like 1,200, 1,300 grams. And even if the bush elephant has a larger brain, we still have more neurons. And these 16 billion neurons have a lot of contacts, believe me, so more than the universe. So we need to examine this. And this is what I will now try to summarize in this presentation. So first I will talk about what is brain donation. What does this mean? Brain donation means that an individual who has an early stage of a disease, but diagnosed something disease, disorder, decides that uh, or recognizes or feels that he wants to have the next generation of the patients and he wants that his brain sh uh, examined for research. And then he says this to the medical doctor and signs up for brain donation. And many years later, after this individual dies, then the family still gives a consent 
And then this brain is studied very, very detailed and, and we try to understand many things from these brains, which I will show you. But there is also a part which we call precise diagnosis, which means that we give a feedback to the clinician, which means that we teach, we, we study this, and, and for the families they also understand what was exactly the disease. So actually, an autopsy in this sense is a gift of knowledge, and this is known since many thousand years in the human sciences. That, uh, that is what actually taught us a lot of things. And also, very importantly, for many families and fami family members, this provides a kind of a peace of mind, because they saw the, the family member and they thought that they cannot help in all aspects, they were not sure what is exactly this disease. So performing such an examination and talking again about it for some families helps to understand and to, to cope with this uh, thing what happens. So in the ancient Greece, they even said that the death is, helps the, uh, the living. So what is uh, brain donation looks that uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to talk about autopsy, and uh, usually the individuals who want to do this, they, they decide pretty early about this, and the families also decide about this, because when the death happens, the feelings are very strong, and it's, it's not easy to talk about this, and not easy to talk with families and, and say that, do you want to donate the brain for research or not? Obviously, in these hours, nobody wants to talk about this. So this is why we recommend that these have to be considered earlier than this. Uh, when will I hear about results? So obviously, every family member who requests uh, any information gets this information, so gets feedback. But of course, this has to be requested because some families don't want to do this. And what you have to know is that it, it is very difficult to do uh, brain autopsy and make research. So it usually takes like three to six months to come up with some results. So don't expect that in next day you get a fantastic uh, detailed information. And finally, there is an aspect of capacity, which means that studying a human brain takes a lot of time. So obviously we cannot cope with large amounts. And this is why we usually uh, may, uh, present a, a complex brain donation system where the clinical data and follow-up is an important aspect. So now I would like to talk about uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Neurodegenerative disease is, uh, are uh, progressive disorders and the clinical symptoms are due to the loss of neurons or nerve cells. This is what is in our brains, in our gray matter, and this is the contact between these nerve cells makes us think, to feel, have emotions, to have movements. In neurodegenerative diseases, these nerve cells die at a certain point, but the, because there's 16 billion of nerve cells, it takes a lot of time, but this causes uh, neurological symptoms. And this slowly goes, progresses. This is how the gray matter looks in the microscope. This, are, this is a neuron, for example, or this is a neuron. This, all these are neurons or nerve cells. In addition, there are also supportive cells, these smaller ones. So this is what you see in a microscope in a normal brain. In the last 15 years, however, there was a dramatic change in our knowledge because we don't say now that neurodegenerative disease is loss of neurons, but we add a second sentence that, or the second part of the sentence, that in addition there is deposition of proteins. And this is the result of the last 15 years. So if I have this presentation like 20 years ago or when I started my career, I wouldn't talk about this. I just say, okay, loss of neurons. Now we talk about deposition of proteins. So in the next slide, it might seem complicated, but what you see here in brown color are visualized proteins in the brain. And we are talking about at least six types of proteins. And what I want to show you here is that it's an incredible variability how these look like 
in different cells. And all of these characterize different clinical phenotype, different prognosis, how long the patient lives, what, are, what is the dynamics of the clinical symptoms. In addition, we talk now at least about the target. So we know that proteins are important. We have at least six proteins which we think that they are important. So we can use these to develop biomarkers. Biomarker means that from bodily fluids, we try to detect these proteins. And then we can a little bit uh, pre more precise diagnosis. But proteins means also that we have a targets for therapy. So there are ideas that because these proteins are so important that if we develop therapies against the proteins, then we can slow or stop the disease. And I will show you two examples. One is a Parkinson disease and the other one is progressive supranuclear palsy. For example, Parkinson disease is characterized by the abnormal deposition of a protein called alpha-synuclein. Progressive supranuclear palsy is characterized by the abnormal deposition of a protein called tau. And when the patient goes to the clinic, maybe this blue colored disease will look like the red one, like clinically, like the symptoms. But the protein is completely different. And if you look in the microscope, in a Parkinson disease brains, you will see these very strange structures. These are called Lewy bodies. This is a 100 years old uh, discovery. So you see these things in the nerve cell, and I think you agree that this nerve cell looks differently than what I showed in my first slide. And we are able to visualize alpha-synuclein, which is now a red color, which shows that this labels or paints this, and we can see that these Lewy bodies contain alpha-synuclein. PSP, so progressive sucranuclear palsy, has tau protein. And this is how it looks like in the microscope. And importantly, it's not only in nerve cells, but also in supportive cells. The recent couple of years also showed completely new concepts about these neurodegenerative diseases. One is the cell-to-cell -cell propagation theory, and the other one is the mixture of proteins. What does cell-to-cell -cell propagation mean? Cell-to-cell -cell propagation means that this is a nerve cell, this blue thing, which I, I draw here, yes, but it, I hope it looks like what I showed you in the microscope. <laughs> and this is a central part of the nerve cell where the information is processed. And then this nerve cell has a normal protein, this green one, which for any reason, changes the three-dimensional structure, so the outlook, and it becomes a bad protein. If the nerve cell is strong enough, then it can fight against this bad protein and make an inclusion body, like it puts it to the garbage. It's in the house, but it's not disturbing us so much. Or, if not so lucky, then it breaks it up and releases it from the cell and the other cell takes it up, and this will die. And then the other cell takes it up. So this is the cell-to-cell -cell propagation of bad proteins. This is a completely new theory. But this is why the diseases progress, because every time a new that pro bad protein will jump to a new cell, to a new brain region. But this takes like many years, like even 10, 15 years, that it jumps from a cell, it has a 16 billion cells to jump, so it takes a lot of time. The other concept, which is completely new and dramatically changed our ideas, is that unfortunately, in some diseases, it's not only one protein, but there's a mixture of proteins. For example, here I show you an aging study, and these different colors, like the yellow, the blue, the brown, the black, green, and white, uh, red, indicates different proteins. And if you look at an aged population in a district of a city, then you will see that there are individuals with a mixture of different, even five different proteins, or four, or three, or one. So this means that 
we, ha we, ha we need an individualized approach to therapy. We need a personalized approach. We cannot say that I have a tablet for everybody. We need to be personalized. This patient has a mixture of these proteins. The other patient has only one protein. So we have to make a cluster or group of patients and say that this can be targeted with one, medic one tablet, which is good against one protein, but this has need a lot of other therapies. So then I would like to show you how we use or how we work with human brains. So these are the driving concepts. As I told you, it's, it's not an easy job, so you need to be very committed. So the colleagues or myself, we are very committed to do this. We don't care about time or we don't care about this. We just want to get to the next step. So if we work with human brains, we need these four points to be very uh, discretion, very importantly, empathy for the family, patience for the f in the direction of the family, and respect with the human brain and for the family. In the background, there are ethical concepts and transparency. So there's no secret things going on. And finally, feedback. Feedback means that it's requested, then we uh, provide uh, results of the examination. And what can we examine? We can examine which brain region is first affected in disease, because then we will know which, what, tar what is the target. Then we can evaluate which proteins and with what kind of mixture of proteins are going on in the brain, because then we can try to develop therapy targets. We can examine genes, what influences the disease, we can evaluate how this cell-to-cell -cell propagation happens, and we can see how could we block this, because we can see what takes it up, what throws it out, so we can provide information for therapy development. And also clinical information, how can we better diagnose. This is how a human brain looks like, and I wanted to show you this. You can see this also, in the, not this one, but another one in the internet. Of course, so it's not a big uh, secret, but at least I wanted to show you. So this is the upper part and this is the bottom part. And then this is how we process. So we make samples of these. For example, this is a memory center. And then we make sections which we look in the microscope. So in summary, this, our group uh, performs research on neurodegenerative conditions using post-mortem human brain tissue. And the reason for this is because many questions are still remained to be answered. We do not yet know how to cure these diseases and we do not know how to prevent these diseases. What is the first step for brain donation? The first step is that you have to talk to your physician, your, I mean the neurologist and bring your questions. And as I told you, it's, I'm the same person as you are. It's not easy to talk about this, but that is, you can always address this to, your, to the colleagues. And we have a complete information if you want to think about it or read about this. And what can you expect? The family members can expect feedback. So I will make every two months one long day and appointments and every 30 minutes uh, I can provide information or discuss the results of the, of the neuropathological examination. The full transparency and ethical coverage of the, res uh, of the research and respect with the human brain tissue and for the family and a very strong commitment to research and ethics. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thanks, Gabor. Um, obviously, we'll open it up for, for questions now. I think one of the things that I should mention is that, as many of you know, um, we deal with diseases that are not necessarily neurodegenerative as well. A good example is many of the dystonias we deal with, and some of the representatives from the Dystonia Medical Research uh, Foundation are here today. And this is a good example where we don't understand the basis of the disorder at all and where brain donations and study with the more modern techniques uh, may make 
tremendous discoveries. So uh, it's not just neurodegeneration, although we're, we have uh, many patients with neurodegenerations we study, but all forms of brain diseases, and in our case, uh, uh, brain diseases causing movement disorders. Um, as Gabor has pointed out, it, it's difficult to talk to patients about brain donation, but I think um, we need to sort of take the, um, the seriousness out of it as well. I think uh, you can't take it with you. It's going to mush really quick. I mean, brains, once you die, the brain is, really becomes mush very, very quickly. And you can leave a legacy. It's, some people, it's mush now. So some, my, my, my kids would claim mine went that way a long time ago. Um, so uh, it is a legacy you can leave uh, the future, and it really is a very important one. And I try to make a little bit light of it with my patients. When the Sopranos were on television, I always used to say, we're not going to take it before you're finished using it. And I won't send Tony Soprano out to get it before you're finished using it either. So uh, if, if you can do it in that way, you realize that it's, it's part of living, dying is part of living, and this is a really important legacy that you or your family members might, uh, might give to others that suffer from brain disease. So I'm going to open up for questions and allow you to grill Dr. Uh, Kovacs. <laughs> one, but it is actually, I think, important. You mentioned at some point that you'll, you could have too many brains. One, uh, maybe it was you who said this, but one of you said, what happens then? If you get too many donated, you can't cope with the volume. What do you do with them? I mean, <clears throat> we will not take the brains for brain donation if we reach our capacity. So what I want, we will not take 300 brains if we don't have the capacity. We will stop like 40, 50. This is an example. But why I wanted to show you this, that it might be a point that we will say that, excuse me, we don't have the capacity, please don't send it. And this is why I wanted to show you this slide and mention this, that we are also not many, too many people here, I mean researchers to do this. So I just wanted to raise awareness that we just cannot get every three, four hundred cases per year. Yes, I mean, this is, the, uh, so th this is a difficult, very difficult point because the family wants to donate, but I usually raise this issue that they, uh, at a certain point when they, the individual dies and then they say that please perform the autopsy, it might be that we say that, sorry, we reached our capacity, please don't do the autopsy or don't send it to us. I just we're, wanted to raise this yeah, point. We're a long ways away from that, but I think it is reasonable to raise this issue, but I think uh, we've, we've got a capacity, and uh, he, he can stay and do overtime. <laughs> <laughs> no, Perhaps I should have asked question number three first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about this, the idea that if you wanted to, say, donate your organs and other parts as well, um, like, what is the process that to, uh, like, you know, most people sort of arrange for when they die, they have, you know, they might want to be cremated or whatever, but if we wanted to donate our brains and then have the rest of the body used for other things, how do you go about arranging that? I mean, so as, as I understand your question is that uh, if somebody wants to donate the different organs to different... Right. Yes. So, I mean, this is, uh, obviously, this is written in their consent that what they want to do, and then the body is transported to a pathology department, and then they will follow the request. So the brain comes to our place, and all other organs go to the place where the individual decided to do this. And that's all on the consent? It is, it is in this information sheet, and then they can decide what they do. But let me tell you that other organs usually are not donated for research. Right. They can donate, I mean, if somebody dies in an accident, they can take it and transplant it. That, that's a different thing. Right. Usually, people donate only their brains for research, so they don't donate the liver for research. Right. Because it's um, like... Studying liver diseases needs other aspects, so many people undergo biopsy, like during life they take small samples and the researchers work with these samples. So usually post-mortem 
tissue research is focusing on the brain and not the, for other organs. Okay, so but that, if, <coughs> sorry, sorry. if the individual decides that he, and we have the capacity, we might examine internal organs also and examine whether these proteins also affect other organs. Right. Okay, and also, do you have uh, the idea of a control group as well for people who don't have Parkinson's and want to, contr and want to donate their brain to help with research in Parkinson's? Yes, uh, this is an excellent question because obviously we need these uh, control brains. Currently, these control brains uh, is, is a very rare, but it happens. So this means that if somebody dies unexpectedly and... Uh, thought about this during the life or the family request this and they have the legal uh, uh, background or grounds to do this, then it can happen. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we, you'll be seeing in, in attending our clinic uh, shortly, we're going to start putting out more brochures and, and flyers and things like that about brain donation. And I think if loved ones are interested in wanting to give their own brains, that, uh, those that aren't suffering from these diseases, within a limited number, I think it'd be very important. I think we do need the control brains, and we'd be very glad to talk to you about that. And we might take it before you're willing to. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think. We, yeah, let's go over there because they beat you, but we'll get you next. Uh, could you tell me where the alpha synuclein comes from? Does it come from the gut, or where does it come from? Thank you. This is a, we can talk about this for hours. So the <laughs> alpha synuclein all of us has in our brains. It's a normal protein which is very important for the contact between nerve cells. And we have also a subpopulation of nerve cells in our gut, which innervates the bowel movements. So as you say, there is a theory that this uh, change from normal to bad protein of alpha-synuclein happens in the gut. The reasons, I don't want to talk about this, but let's say pesticides or for any other reasons, what I don't know, or infection or something. And then this bad protein will slowly, through the nerves, go to the brain and then cell to cell in the brain. So this is a theory, yes. Every, every one of those proteins that Dr. Kovacs mentioned that become abnormal are actually normal at one time or other. They, they all have normal functions, and alpha-synuclein is one of them, as he's told. Yes, and the, the returning back to your question, this is also why sometimes we need to examine peripheral organs also. For example, to map alpha-synuclein, whether it is really in every Parkinson patient in the gut or not every Parkinson patient. So this is a very good question. Um, back, back to the donation, my understanding from what you're saying is that the form that we fill out for the Ministry of Transport offering donations doesn't cover brain research. No. So this is something very yes. different from what we've already all that, signed up for. Yes, thank you. That type of donation is for like transplantation, so like kidney or liver, so that is a different, yes, yes. Yeah, typically, if you die the way a lot of us do, unfortunately, a slow death at a certain age, um, most of your tissues aren't very useful for transplantation. So that's why it's the Minister of Transport, you die in a more vehicle accident suddenly, and that's where your, your uh, organs may be more useful. Thank you. Um, if you get a surge of brains in the next five to 10 years, can you anticipate a cure for Parkinson's? Yeah, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an affidavit while you're at it. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> there are already therapies in the pipeline. So the question is whether the target is correct. So this means that it seems that there are already methods for developing novel therapies. So they might be or they are partly already soon in the clinics. But the question is if, if this target the correct target. So, and this is why if we evaluate these brains, we can come up that to precise the target better. 
So fine tune the target. So are we looking at um, like the goal is you, you'd be able to um, affect the function of the person who has Parkinson, or actually is the ultimate goal to cure the, the disease? I mean, the idea would be to prevent or, or before it starts. So let's say that the concept today is that when the patient goes to the neurologist and the neurologist say that this individual has, let's say, Parkinson disease, it might be that the first protein change happened like 10 years before. And it might be that it happened in the gut. This is still a research question. But this means that at least this new concept opens a window for us and says that, yes, if we find an early diagnostic marker, maybe we can start a preventive therapy 10 years before. For this, we need a marker, and this is why we need to evaluate how these bad proteins get to the blood, for example, or which of these proteins get to the blood. Because then, you know, after 50, then people could be screened for blood test. But before doing that, we need also a therapy to prevent it, because maybe I examine somebody at, when he's 50 and say that this individual in 20 years will get Parkinson, but if I don't have a therapy, it's not ethical to do this. But this is exactly what uh, this can help. The other thing to add to that, though, is you asked a cure. You saw that people are different. The yes. protein combinations may vary considerably, and it may be more than just the protein. There are other combinations of factors. So it may be many cures. It may be that we're going to have to have what's called precision medicine that is directed more at individuals or subgroups of individuals. Yes, so the, the, the idea is that rather than thinking that there will be one, one the medicine, it is most likely there will be like 10 groups of patient groups who have Parkinson, but this group will have a little bit different therapy than the other one. Please hear because she's already... Um, do you um, anticipate... Um, Get the microphone so people can hear you. First of all, thank you very much. This was uh, very um, informative. Do you anticipate with this research um, that it will enable uh, you to diagnose Parkinson's um, clinically rather than, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like a, 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 an actual, di right now it's, it's really, it's, it's a, no, right now it's a clinical medical diagnosis. So, or an observation, well, maybe that's what it is. Do you anticipate that this will enable you to make a more, you know, definite uh, diagnosis in the future? Yes. So, usually the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson disease is usually a, a successful, or it's a kind of, uh, the clinicians recognize the Parkinson symptoms. Mm -hmm. But some patients will worsen like rapidly, like in a couple of years, the other one in 15 years. So that difference is between the individuals. And this is what we try to evaluate, that why somebody like 20 years getting the same therapy, the other one like in five, six years have dramatic problems. Is there um, a process that you can do that today via, like with people that are suffering from this disease, um, with... Uh, I don't know, the technology that we have? Currently, it is, there is no really markers which predict that the individual who comes to the clinic will be a rapid progressive form or a relative benign form and last for 20. So, so, but this protein issue, I think, will change the way we diagnose. So uh, one of the points that Gabor made was that we do see these other diseases that look very similar when their patient first presents. So a lot of patients with progressive supranuclear palsy look exactly like Parkinson's, and you might mix Parkinson's with progressive supranuclear palsy, or there's another disease called multiple system atrophy, and these all can be very similar at the beginning. And this is where using this knowledge that Dr. Kovacs is talking about may actually change the way we diagnose. There, there will be diagnostic tests that are much more effective and definitive than what we provide today, for sure. Yeah. 
since you can since you're going to identify people um, with different structural aspects of the brain um, after death, do you we be able to correlate it with behaviors and symptoms before death? Yes, thank you very much for this very important question. So, this is what I also showed. This is very important to include uh, individuals for brain donation who come to the clinic and have a very precise clinical follow-up. And also, as I showed, there will be a feedback, and this means that we can discuss the, the family can ask that, Dr. Kovacs, why do you think my, uh, somebody had a behavioral change in the course of the disease? And we can discuss this, why this happened. I mean, during life, there is already diagnostic procedures to diagnose whether somebody has behavioral changes or psychological tests. The reasons why they have is a little bit more difficult to decide during life. So our diagnostic. Uh, yeah, but, that, but I think you're getting at something very important. We can then, with that knowledge, go back and with these other tests, apply the other tests to say that this person who now has this form of behavioral problem or whatever probably has this particular disease and may therefore benefit from this particular treatment. So it's, it's going to be a step wide. It's going to take a long time to do that. I mentioned the Rossi donation. Um, that allows us, with um, fairly uh, intense detail, to collect information on all aspects of the patients that are coming through that program. So we assess our patients in the clinic in some detail. And those of you that come to the clinic, you know we're writing down the numbers and we're scoring and all of the rest. But uh, the kind of research detail that is required sometimes means a lot more with many, many questionnaires and we're going to have patients filling out surveys online and a variety of other things. And it's that kind of intense information and then knowing the post-mortem information, knowing the proteins and the new um, evaluations that will come along, I think we're going, are going to make some big changes in the way we approach these decisions. I'm assuming that, um, that the slides that we saw of the proteins in the brain um, were of uh, deceased brains. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, is there no, um, there are no MRIs or anything that can, can detect? Yes. Nothing? Uh, actually, there's, uh, for the Protein concept, that proteins are important, this opened a new method which is called PET examination, which is abbreviation for oh, right. positron emission tomography. If for the patient it's a little bit like MRI, so lace on the bed and then the machine but it is coming. But differentiate between. But, and this PET examination can visualize one of these proteins, which is beta amyloid, which is in Alzheimer's disease thought to be important. And researchers try to develop for alpha synuclein or for tau, but it's very difficult because these are inside the cells, very small, very difficult to see it with uh, this magnification. But actually, this is, a, this is the future also. And this, what I showed you, the protein concept, it opened a lot of new avenues for markers for diagnosis. But it takes more, still, more information is needed. Okay. But I'm assuming also the tau is just in our guts all the time? Yeah, that was a jump from this <laughs> MRI examination. So, I mean, currently we think that alpha synuclein is in the gut, and we have less information on tau in the gut, and currently we don't see much evidence that tau is important in the gut, but on the other hand, there is little done on this. So tau diseases were not really examined in the gut. With, with respect to your question though, uh, Alzheimer's is way ahead of us. Alzheimer's, there are these positron emission tomography scans that evaluate the two major proteins that are deposited in Alzheimer's. And we now know how it evolves. So the A-beta or beta amyloid in Alzheimer's is deposited 
long before the tau. Tau is also part of Alzheimer's disease, but it's a different kind of tau than in progressive supranuclear palsy. And so you evolve from the de deposition of one protein, and somehow that generates the deposition of the other protein that is then very important to the cell death. And we're learning a great deal about that progress and how we can interrupt it. And that's what we're hoping is going to happen in Parkinson's and PSP and these other diseases. I, I, you, you sort of got into it anyway, but I, I guess what I'm just trying to understand is by studying the brains and whatever else with it, post-mortem, you come back to the living and, and with, with ideas for biomarkers that will lead to all these various branches of movement disorder or whatever, the brain disorders. Is that, am I understanding that correct? Yes, you, you summarize this very nicely, thank you. I mean, it's uh, very... And, and also, you the point, something yes. I, I wasn't paying attention, but the, the, uh, um, the gut and brain are come to the lab together? They, they, it depends, it, on, the how it depends on the wish of the individual. Okay. Usually not. So this is the, that's why we don't know too much about this. Right, okay. So usually well, not, mind. but it might be. autopsy programs that are whole body <laughs> yes. autopsy programs, and those provide very important information. And some of the patients that agree to post-mortem hopefully will agree to whole body autopsy. Yeah. Um, are there tests that Thank you. That compare the blood of people who are still alive at various stages of Parkinson's to see what proteins show up at various stages and whether, say, the tau or the alpha synuclein or whatever is in the blood, if it's a protein and can be tested? There, are, there is research going on which tries to detect alpha synuclein and tau in the blood, yes. Of live people. Of live people. And some of these studies started like 10 years ago, and they follow these individuals, and some of them go to brain donation. So there can be a feedback whether the test, what they perform, blood collected 10 years ago, is relevant or correct or not. So there is research going on. So I, alpha synuclein and tau can be detected in the blood, but not yet the disease specific form. So we don't know whether this is the correct disease specific form what we detect in blood. So that's why this research is needed. And that's why brain donation also can give feedback to this research. So the, the uh, idea that Dr. Kovacs gave you of the cell to cell transmission, remember that, cell to cell spread, um, one of the aspects of that goes to mad cow disease or Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, where remember that was the abnormal protein that spread to the next cell. One of the unique aspects of these diseases that's very important to understand now is that when that abnormal protein gets into the next cell, it recruits normal protein. It changes the normal protein. And that ability, the abnormal protein to change the normal, is now influencing the way we may be able to analyze these proteins in fluids. So in spinal fluid, maybe blood, maybe skin biopsies. And Dr. Kovacs is working on one of those techniques that may provide useful ways of looking at the presence of these proteins. So would it make sense for people when they go for their annual checkups or whatever to give blood as markers? Um, well, I think it would have to be part of a research study. So as we start to develop these programs, we're going to be starting to ask patients and family members to give blood if we're doing a study, for example, looking at these proteins. But that, that needs a, a research study. So going through a regular lab and just giving blood wouldn't do anything. Um, I, I worked a number of years ago on a cancer. Oh, thank you. I worked a number of years ago on a cancer research project where other people, not myself, I reviewed the records, but other people would collect um, uh, D, the DNA and out. They would do DNA analysis of the cancer tumors, the colon cancer tumors, and they were able to classify them: ABC tumor or DEF tumor, that kind of thing, and then the treatment and how well they did was correlated. I wonder if the same kind of DNA analysis has, would have anything to do with this or if that was possible. 
Yes, this is possible. So this uh, the influence of genes on the development of disease is being studied and this research is also related to this, what I showed you. Thank you very much. And That's last exactly question. what we're thinking of doing in neurodegenerative diseases. So um, brain diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's uh, need to be think, thought of like cancer. And so you need to classify those with very specific techniques. And as we've said, recognize that A cancer is not the same as D cancer, and they may require very different therapies. Same thing with the brain diseases that we deal with. So the whole idea of changing the way we approach and also using combination therapies or cocktails of therapies. How many people do you hear of our friends that get cancer that get one drug? That's rare now. Now, there are some specific drugs that are used like that, but usually it's a cocktail, getting various aspects of the tumor biology. The same applies, I think, to neurodegeneration. Last question. So we're running out of time here. Are there any burning? We've got one last question there. Why don't we? Can you just it better be good, because this is the last <laughs> question. <laughs> This is very interesting, and, uh, and my thought is, uh, from a time standpoint, where do we sit? You know, the research you're doing on these two specific things, um, how far along are we in this research? And when did it really start? And how many places in the world is, are doing what you're doing? I mean, uh, every country, I mean, like uh, Canada has two, three, these brain donation systems, U.S. has more. In Europe, every country, bigger countries have one or two, so it's not so many because uh, this type of experts like myself is like in Canada, like 30, 40 neuropathologists, so uh, it's very not few very well. few uh, doing this type of research. It's partly because of uh, financial reasons, because these are very time and money consuming and uh, some of the research money doesn't go into this because it, it doesn't produce, it, it takes a lot of time to, to get uh, results. But actually looking back the last decades, all of the dramatic rediscoveries were linked to this type of research. So like detecting the discovery of alpha-synuclein or any of these proteins, they didn't come from other places. <laughs> okay. okay, well, um, we'll stop at that point. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found this educational, useful, entertaining. Uh, please uh, enjoy each other's company and stay for a little while before they throw you out. And uh, <laughs> if there are any questions that weren't answered, I'm, I'll hang around and uh, be happy to... Uh, to speak to you. Thanks again for your attention. Keep, keep your eyes out for the notices of uh, future events, okay? And thanks, Kathy, and the team for supporting us.